Today I want to tell a story about us and what makes us so different from the rest of the natural kingdom. Because even though we are natural, we do things very differently. And I want to focus specifically on our thoughts and how our thoughts inform our designs and have informed how different our designs are. Where this all comes from, though, is a fear. We're afraid of the unknown. That's why you don't like breaking up. That's why, why we don't like death. But we're afraid of the complexity of the unknown. And we're afraid of nature in that way because cognitively, we're actually not even capable to understand the complex reality of nature. And we'll even simplify our, our environments to be able to live within them. So let's think about death. Uh, that's the ultimate unknown. And one of the ways we deal with uncertainty is we create assumptions. A lot of us assume maybe we're going to go to heaven. There might be a couple thinking they're going to hell. But we make assumptions so that we can actually deal with that complexity because we can't handle it. We've also made assumptions in our designs. So for example, Newton. We use Newtonian thinking to take apart nature, put it into pieces and study them in isolation. And then in that isolation, rearrange them to make more predictable and stable engineered environments. We also built our, built our cities on the assumption that unlimited technology and unlimited, unlimited economic growth is the key to our well-being. Embedded in that, you might notice that we also have assumed there's unlimited resources and that nature exists for our consumption. So there's a couple problems with these assumptions is that we've assumed we're different than nature and separate from nature, so we've actually built ourselves separate and different from nature. And there's one key thing about nature is that it hates gradients. Nature will n naturally, spontaneously, and coherently self-organized to dissipate any, any gradients. And so what we've done is we've actually created a gradient between us and the natural world. Our cities are so different. And I know there's a gradient because if we left the city, nature would take over. It's just a law of thermodynamics. So the problem with that, well, there's two problems. One, it takes a lot of energy to resist that natural state, that natural flow into our cities. So we put a lot of energy into resisting nature. And two, the greater the gradient, the greater the potential for collapse and reorganization. So the bigger and more cities that we create, the more the gradient becomes. But I'm not really interested in this idea of large-scale collapse. I'm more interested in how we could shift our systems by shifting our thinking. And that's where biomimicry comes in. By definition, biomimicry is innovation inspired by nature. One of the most classic examples is Velcro. Velcro was inspired by the burrs that stick to your pants when you're hiking in the woods. It was invented by a guy in the 40s, a Swiss engineer, who finally got fed up with those burrs sticking to his dog hair, and he took it under a microscope and copied that hooking mechanism to make one of the most successful adhesives of our time. Another very commonly uh, presented example in biomimicry is whale power. Here, engineers in were inspired by the bumps of the, the humpback whale fin, and they copied those bumps and applied it to a wind turbine blade and found that this blade runs 20% more efficient at slower wind speeds and quieter than traditional blades. So what's cool is that we recognize nature's been doing design for billions of years, and it's actually evolving the designs to be the most efficient and sustainable that they can be. But biomimicry is about shifting our perception and recognizing that we do build with assumptions and have been building with assumptions, and then also recognizing that nature also designs in the very same context as us. So my paradigm shifted in 2004 when I was an engineering student at Queen's University and I took this elev elective called Math and Poetry. I thought it was going to be the math of poetry, but it was really just math and then an hour and a half of poetry. <laughs> but the math teacher, well, both teachers were brilliant. The math teacher was really good at dealing with our delicate egos, and he had us actually believe we were coming up with these theorems. So does anyone know what this one is? Fibonacci, <laughs> right on. So the Fibonacci sequence is just a sequence of numbers that when you add the two numbers before the third, you get the third. So 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, one, pl 1 plus 2 is 3, and so on. And then he had us play with the geometries and shapes of these cubes. So a 1 by 1 cube and a 1 by 1 cube actually fit beside that 2 by 2 cube. So we made this beautiful rectangle called the golden ratio. We didn't make it. We thought we did. And then he had us explore, what if we connected those rectangles? And we got this beautiful spiral. And he says, well, where have you seen this before? What about here? What about here? What about in the packaging, the seed packaging of a sunflower? 
Or what about in the way that waves crash and fluids naturally flow? You see, this spiral is ubiquitous in nature. Even our skin pores follow that same pattern. And so we discussed this way, the way that architects and designers have used this spiral and this golden ratio in their art and in their designs. And we talked about this natural relationship we, we have with it because we are nature. Humans came from nature, so we have this attraction to this form because it's so ubiquitous. We also talked about some of the most beautiful people in the world and how <laughs> some of their ratios in their face <laughs> actually fit the Fibonacci sequence. So here I was, an engineer, learning about nature and learning that nature does design, and it fundamentally shifted my thinking. All of a sudden, all the math and science I was learning to engineer the environment, I realized the environment's already doing engineering and we could learn a lot from it. So I got obsessed and uh, pursued this biomimicry passion uh, right up until a PhD and through my PhD. And when I finished, my dad is a very practical farmer. He said, okay, Jamie, now show me what biomimicry is. And that inspired me to apply it and to practice the application. So I've partnered with uh, Jay Harmon down in California and his company, Pax Scientific. So Pax Scientific has made this impeller. And what is beautiful about this impeller is that it pulls fluids rather than pushes them. So it's a much more efficient at moving fluids, at mixing fluids than a traditional fan. And it's a lot quieter. And why it's more efficient is because he's actually understood how fluids flow. So what's crazy about nature is that they will shape their forms to whatever the flows around it inform it to do. It's not trying to force anything. It's letting nature inform the design. You think of kelp and the way it'll curl in a crashing wave. It'll curl because it's trying to res resist getting pulled up. So this can move 10 million gallons of water with the electricity of two light bulbs. I've also partnered with Tridel, a condo developer, to have us rethink walls. So as an art piece, we've developed something based on Chao Chen, who's um, a designer in Amsterdam. Because when you think of walls, a good engineering wall is one that's predictable, it's stable. It comes from that old paradigm of resistance. But think about a wall in nature, it could be your skin. And skin can grow, it can shed, it can expand, sweat, grow hair. It's so responsive to its environment, even at the local scale. This part of my skin's behaving differently than this one. So this wall, this art piece, is inspired by the pine cone and the way that pine cones will close when it's wet to avoid dropping its seeds and open when it's dry. And Chow has copied this mechanism without using electricity or any mechanical devices, a wall that opens and closes just because of moisture and rain. With B plus H Architects, I helped design a house in India, which is crazy. But we use biomimicry technologies and principles in the house specifically for passive ventilation. So we in, we're inspired by the elephant and the barrel cactus. The elephant's interesting because those skin pores, those ridges, actually hold moisture in over longer periods of time. So in the heat of the day, it can evapotranspirate or ev evaporative cool the organism over longer periods. The barrel cactus has those ridges, which creates a natural shading. So it creates these little microclimates inside those ridges that will pull the hot air away from the, from the uh, barrel cactus. And now I'm working with designers, architects, and planners to reimagine our cities and communities, starting to get away from that idea of separation and build from a non-separation paradigm and integrate nature back into our designs, both in terms of how we think in biomimicry, but also in through biophilic design as well. So here we're reimagining what our cities could be. Imagine our cities function like a forest. Each tree is automatically and autonomously changing to its environment, picking up information all of the time and changing and making adaptations at small scales. Imagine our buildings could do that, could self-heal, could breathe, could respond to winter and summer. Imagine we had local patches, decentralized services, so that we didn't have to rely on this system of importation and exportation. Or imagine creating economies like an ecosystem. It's interesting, if you think of a forest, there isn't a tree that's 600 feet above the rest. This paradigm of growth, 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 survival of the fittest. We're actually learning a lot about nature and it's a, a lot more cooperative than we realize. For example, there's things called mother trees. And mother trees will grow and get enough of their resources and once they have enough, they'll actually start to distribute information 
and resources to other trees and other species, even competing species. species. The other thing about nature is that there's no such thing as waste, and everything is working. So imagine creating a waste uh, circular economy where the waste stream of one industry is actually the product of another one, closing the loop. Or imagine making materials like nature and manufacturing like, ma like nature. The spider silk has a strength to weight ratio unlike anything we've ever made as humans. But the crazy thing is that spider's making it at body temperature and pressure, using only the energy of the sun, and it's fully recyclable. Or imagine creating color like peacocks. Instead of using pigne pigmentation and dyes and chemicals, it uses structure to reflect light in different arrays. So the cool thing is this is already happening. There's already self-healing concrete. And it's because technologies are emerging at this time where it's an incredible time. We have incredible technologies like 3D and 4D printing, additive manufacturing, computational architecture, big data. This stuff makes some of these crazy ideas real. And for the next generation, you have this incredible opportunity. Dell put out a study last year saying that 85% of the jobs that will exist in 2030 do not exist today. There's a huge transformation taking place, and the next generation are actually going to be building the next economy. So I inspire that next generation to start to think about their philosophies. Because the world is changing. And I inspire you to start to think about what makes you come alive. Because we're all a natural at something. To do biomimicry, you really have to get into a new paradigm because it's confronting this old way of doing things that we've inherited and become very accustomed to. So you really have to tap into your crea creative potential, tap into your flow, or what I call inner biomimicry. And start to dance with nature. Start to figure out how we can leverage nature and participate with nature in harmony. So there's two things I love about this photo. One, that's my buddy in the front, well, Lisa's feet. And two, we're actually paddling in the wrong direction. <laughs> what we were doing is we we're surfing a little standing wave there in the front. And this is a, it's this incredible feeling where if you get your canoe in the right spot, you don't even have to paddle anymore. You just surf the wave, and you have this euphoric feeling of being in total harmony with the power of nature. I mean, the indigenous people in Hawaii knew this. That's why ho surfing was such a spiritual practice, because you're on the precipice between chaos and this incredible power. So imagine we had a place where we can explore creating in harmony with nature and actually designing with a new paradigm and challenging the status quo. This is what we're doing in Guelph. We have something called the Biomimicry Commons, and it's a disruptor and incubator space for the next generation of technologies and thinking. And I inspire every community to have one of these. And it doesn't, a lot of people ask me, how do I do biomimicry? Or where do I do biomimicry? And I think the best thing to say for now is just change your thoughts and start to create, recognizing that nature does design. And start to challenge those philosophies that we do design with. Because if you don't know what your philosophy is when you're designing, you're probably just relying on the status quo. The way I see it, it's like a car, and your philosophy is a steering wheel, and if you're not conscious of the steering wheel, you're in big trouble. And even Einstein said, we can't solve today's problems with the thinking of the past. So be aware of your thoughts, because in my mind, your thoughts are everything. What we've built is a reflection of our thoughts. I even believe that nature is a reflection of our thoughts. So tap into your inner biomimicry and recognize that when you change your thoughts, you can change the entire world. Thank you very much.